can be dismissed for junior church. Thank you. All righty. How's everybody doing this morning? Good? Well... I invite you to open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. This is going to be a two-part message because of uh, time restrictions this morning, being the uh, first Sunday of the month. For me to be able to handle 12 verses in a short time is, I don't have that gift. <laughs> I can't pass up things. That's my problem. I'll see things and start studying things and, and, and you know... I don't mind preaching for a couple hours, but I don't think you want to sit there for a couple hours. So Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 to 20, a vision of the exalted and glorified Christ. Now, if you search the internet, and uh, or even if you go to different various Sunday school classrooms, right? You see a picture of Jesus, maybe, maybe you go to someone's house and they're somewhat religious, and they have a picture of Jesus on their wall. I did a little search on the internet to see what kind of images were out there. The different portraits that are out there of Jesus, you know, some of those pictures of Jesus and portraits they get, of I, they're so unbiblical, you know? Uh, they almost, in a sense, and I'll probably get in trouble for saying this, but they almost portray him as a sissy. I'm allowed, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that or not, but, but I said it, Okay. Um, maybe you can remove that from the recording there. But, you know, it's just, they come, he comes across like he's a softy, you know. He's not a tough guy. But Jesus was a carpenter, and he was a tough guy. Uh, it, one story we have of Jesus when he, he sees that the, the uh, temple, right, was being used as a temple of dens, and they were selling things in there, and he, and he begins to, he gets angry, and he, and he kicks everybody out of the temple, I mean, if Jesus was like one of the reg regular religious people, the rabbis, right, uh, with the soft hands and all that, he probably would have somebody stand up to him and say, you can't do this. But they were all fearful, and they all kind of, you know, scooted out of the temple because Jesus probably wasn't like the rest of the guys. He was probably a tough-looking guy. But yet, in the same way, he was attractive. He was uh, appealing to the crowd, and people were, were drawn to him. And so he had this image of him that the Scriptures usually... The scriptures portray, but people today give a false representation of what he looks like. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to read verses 9 to 20 and give you another vision or image of Jesus that I believe this is what Jesus looks like right now. So if you have your Bibles, let me read verses 9 to 20. God's Word says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation, and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the seven golden lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with, with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like the fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and, 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 and his countenance was like the sun shining in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But as he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which, you, which are and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Father, I pray that you will guide us in our time now as we want to hear from you. That your word would come alive to us. That you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see in the heart to understand you give me the ability to help me, Lord, to teach your word and give each one of us what we need today. We need you and your mercy upon us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And so we see his picture. John is on the island of Patmos because of Jesus, because of the testimony of Jesus. He's given a command to write down the vision that he sees. And if you think about that, it's a lot harder to write down what you're seeing as opposed to write down what you hear. If you're hearing things, you're hearing it, you're writing down what you hear. But when you're seeing something, it's a little harder to write down. And so John is told to write down what he sees. And he sees an image of Jesus that he's never seen before. And I know that because he had to turn around because the voice that he heard was not familiar to him. And we know John as one of the apostles who was with Jesus while he was on the earth. And so he would have been familiar with that voice that he heard. But he had to turn around. That means he wasn't familiar. He would, this is a different kind of a voice. It's not the same. But Jesus is different as he is here in, in Revelation. But he's given his image and his vision of Jesus. Jesus is exalted and he's glorified. Unbelievable vision. And so as I was thinking about how I can preach this text to you this morning, how would it be a, applicable for us? I began to think about the people that, that uh, John is being told to give this message to and what they were going through. An unbelievable encouragement it would be to these early believers who were being persecuted by the Jewish community. They had nowhere to go to worship couldn't worship freely like you and I are doing today. And they had to worship in secret because they were being persecuted for the name of Jesus. It wasn't a friendly environment. It was so much persecution going on that they, they turned the Roman government against these Christians were looked upon as a cult, not a friendly group. And so they had to worship the Lord. And at this point in history, uh, the church was being persecuted in an unbelievable way. And so... John is on an island. He's, he was arrested for what he believed in, for serving the Lord and for talking about Jesus. He's arrested and put on an island with a bunch of other criminals. And so the church is running and hiding. And so this message of Jesus 
The vision of Jesus exalted and glorified, not defeated, not suffering anymore. No more blood on his body and beaten to a pulp, but he's exalted and glorified. And so what an image that would do for these believers. It would, it would help them to see that their suffering and their, and their plight, that they're, what they're going through, is it's going to be short-lived. Jesus is victorious. He's exalted above all their suffering. And so their suffering is short-lived. And then also, man, it's worth it. It's worth it. Whatever I got to go through for Jesus, it's worth it. If I got to suffer, it's worth it. If I got to go through some struggles, it's worth it. Jesus is exalted. He's not defeated. Satan didn't win. The world didn't win. Jesus has won. He's victorious. And so knowing that and getting our eyes off ourselves and our eyes off our problems and, and seeing Jesus this way, boy, I don't know what it does for you, but it encourages me to keep pressing on. Don't give up. Be faithful. Take risk for Jesus. That's the message today. And so in these verses 9 to 20, we get a glimpse of the exalted and glorified Jesus. And where is he? He's not far removed from us, brothers and sisters. The picture here is that he's in the midst of the churches. He's, he's evaluating them. He's seeing their life. He looks at what they're doing. He's in the midst of them. He is not far from move, removed, but he's ever present. Wow. This Jesus is not a pushover. This image of Jesus is, man, this guy is kind of scary in a sense, is he not? Powerful. This is the first of the three different visions that John has given of Jesus. In chapter 5, if you turn over there, you'll see another image that we have of Christ here in verses 5 through 14. I'm not going to read all these verses, just a few of them. They're, they're feeling hopeless, right? And then in chapter 5, verse 5, But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of, of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, a warrior lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. This Jesus is the warrior lamb that is being worshipped. And if you turn over to chapter 19, verses 11 to 21, another image of Jesus Verse 11 of chapter 19, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. You don't think Jesus this way, do you? This is Jesus, wow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in five fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Man, they don't, you, you come dressed to a battle in white, <laughs> you're dressed in white, you're not thinking about losing that battle, right? You're not thinking about even getting dirty, right? <laughs> Jesus is victorious, man. They're coming, they're, they're victorious. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them. With a rod of iron, he himself treads the, the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's your Jesus. That's my Jesus. He is exalted and he is glorified. No doubt this vision that is given to to John, to write, to give to the churches that you and I can sit back and read today is given to help us, with, give us hope that no matter what kind of suffering you and I are going through, to encourage us to persevere. Don't give up. Don't lose hope. Don't lose your faith. Keep pressing on. Amen?
So as we get this glimpse of Jesus and who he is so that we too would be able to persevere in whatever trouble, whatever difficulty that life has given you, that you would continue to battle against your enemies. And you have enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil are your enemies, so that you would continue to battle and that you and I would be faithful to take great risk for Jesus, that we would be obedient and make disciples of all the nations of the world, that we would do that without fear of rejection or persecution, knowing that our Jesus has conquered it all. He reigns above all, and as he promised, he will return someday. And the question is, will you and I be found faithful? Will we be found faithful? And so my time is short today in these verses, so I'm only going to give you my three points. I have no poem for you this morning. I'll give you my three points of, regarding these 12 verses. We're only going to get through one of them today in a small, small portion of my second point. And here they are if you're taking notes. Number one, the plan of God for every believer involves suffering and service. You will see that in verse 9. The image that the Lord wants us to see during our suffering and during our serving is this image right here, that the person of Christ that we see in verses 10 through 16 ought to produce in us an awe, an awe, and an awe to inspire us as believers to keep pressing on. And finally, the third point that I want to share with you, both now and in the end, the power of Christ should overwhelm and encourage you and I. And that is found in verses 17 to 20. So number one, the plan of God for every believer, regardless of where you're at in your walk with God. I don't know if you were told that in the beginning when you first started walking with Jesus, right? Sometimes we're told that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And, you know, we're told, you know, that message and we're not told the rest of the message, which says, you know what? There's going to be trials and tribulations for every single believer. And we need to understand that the plan of God for every believer involves suffering and it also involves service. No one is exempt if you're a believer in Jesus. And sometimes being blessed as an American living in this country, we view our Christian life in an unbiblical way. We're all guilty of it because the normal life of the Christian that you read in all of the New Testament all of the New Testament brings suffering. And if you even go beyond America, maybe our brothers and sisters who are visiting with us from the Philippines, missionaries there, or where you go to places where it's, you're not free to worship, that you need to really plan carefully how you're worshiping the Lord and the culture that you're living in, you don't have the freedom. And therefore, you will experience suffering if you are trying to worship the Lord Jesus. So you and I, if we're honest, we have it made. We have it made compared to the rest of the world. Well, listen, our day is going to come where we will lose the right to worship and the freedom to assemble. They are at this moment creating laws, even for our state, that makes some of the language that we use that is biblical, that you would call out something as sin to be actually hate speech. I'm not sure if it's passed yet, but they're putting this stuff. Our, the people that you vote and put into office are voting and putting laws together that are actually going to hinder our freedom of worship. The day is coming. We're not going to have a freedom to do that. So sometimes, because the freedom that we have in this world, what does it do? It paints for us an, an expectation of life that comes to us that we're surprised when we suffer shocks us. Oh, I'm not supposed to suffer. I'm not supposed to have difficulties in life. But that's not the picture that we see in the New Testament. Even John's words here in verse 9, he says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience. Let me go back to these words. So John is saying he's both their brother. We're related as a we're in the family of God. And it says companion. Other translation says that we are fellow partakers. We're in this together. In the tribulation, another word for that would be in suffering. 
and in the patience. Another word for that would be that we are persevering. And notice it says, of Jesus Christ. It also could be translated, in Jesus Christ. In other words, this comes with the territory. It comes with the calling of the Lord. If you are, um, if you are a brother or a sister in the Lord, you are a, a fellow partner or you are a companion of other Christians and what they're going through. Why? Because we are in the kingdom of God together. We are all in the same kingdom. We are all followers of Christ. And, and so we're all in Jesus. He said he's on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, so what is John doing here? John is first trying to relate to his fellow churchmen. He is an apostle. He has that title that I am an apostle, but he's not using that title as though he's over them. He's trying to relate to them to try to sympathize with what is going on in their life right now. They're suffering. And so is he. He's in jail. And so he's using language. I am your brother. I am your companion. I am just like you. In other words, even though I'm an apostle and I've been favored in some sense to be able to see the Lord. I saw him alive, and buried, and, ro and he rose again. I, am, I have that qualification. I can relate to your sufferings because I am suffering as well. You know, it's amazing how some Christ circles and some denominations teach that, that if you're suffering as a believer, you're either living in sin or you don't have enough faith. Wow. I don't know where they get that from, but it's not in the Bible, that's for sure. This name it and claim it. We would and we should expect some type of suffering because we are in Jesus. So John says, I am both your brother, I'm your companion, I'm suffering with you, we're in the same kingdom together, we're all in this together. In other words, brothers and sisters, suffering and serving in the kingdom of God is part of God's plan. For every believer, and nobody is exempt. And you and I might have a hard time relating to that. And sometimes we even read our Bibles, and we're trying to find application for our lives. And, and it's, sometimes it's, it's like, wow, I, I don't live that kind of life. I can't relate to that. Why? Why? Well, everybody here has to answer that question for themselves. But let me give you some other scriptures and it's not just here in Revelation that John is saying this. But listen to Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. For to you, you, me, everybody, it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, so it's a gift to believe in Jesus, right? But also to suffer for his name's sake been granted to you to not only believe, but what also comes with that? Suffering. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Paul says, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will what? Suffer persecution. And so you and I look at that verse and we say, well, that's why I'm suffering persecution. That's why I'm having a difficult time. That's what you might some of you might say, or some of you might be looking at that saying, why do I not suffer persecution? All those who desire to be godly, to live godly. So maybe, and I'm not judging anybody here, we all need to look at that verse and say, why am I not suffering any kind of persecution? Is it because I have a, an image of a godly life that is not matched up with what the New Testament teaches? I'm not taking risks for the Lord. I'm not trying to disciple anybody. I'm not speaking up for Jesus. Someone uses his name in vain. I don't say anything. No one knows I'm a Christian. I'm, a, I'm undercover. CIA, right? Christian, think of something. Oh, one of you guys can come up and give me something on that one. I got to answer that question too. One more. If those two weren't bad enough, right? Acts 14, 22, Paul has planted churches, right? And now he's going back to encourage them. The, so look at the words I'm about to read to you as encouragement. 
right? So he goes around strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, saying we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Now, if you are going through sufferings, right? If you are, you know, if you're struggling to live for the Lord because everybody around you is persecuting you and making fun of you and, and making life difficult for you, you can relate to this verse and it says, wow, I'm in the, I'm in the will of God. This is God's will for my life to go through some suffering. Exhorting, he's always, it's an encouragement. But if I'm not taking risks for Jesus and living the life that God wants me to live, I'm just preaching it, brothers and sisters. This is, this is no other way of looking at this. I need to ask myself, why? Why am I not going through that? Yeah, I guess you can blame it on the culture. Things are safe and secure. But have we bought into the American dream that we're trying to live the comfortable life and we don't want to step on anyone's to toes? We don't want to uh, ruffle people's feathers Maybe it's because we don't believe the end is near. Maybe it's because we don't really believe Jesus is coming back. And we're just trying to live a comfortable life and get put our time in, punch the clock in, and that's it. Convicting? Yeah, it's convicting to me too. And so if you are among us this morning and you are, you are living that godly life and you're trying to and pour your life into someone else's life and you're trying to be a, a good person follower of Christ and you're trying to disciple people and you're trying to make an impact in your community and people know you're a believer and, you know, you know when, you, when they say something around you that they know offends you, they even apologize, you know, I'm sorry, I offend, I should, you know, I've got to watch my mouth around you, okay? That, this should encourage you that this is part of God's plan and purpose for your life. It goes on to say, John says that he was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So what is he arrested for? Because he was doing really bad stuff, right? No. For the testimony. For the word of God. That's why he's being arrested. Wow. So let me ask you a question. If our friendly culture that we are living in right now, if it changed radically, and it became against the law to assemble as we are right now, which, you know, we hold on to the Constitution, right, the amendment. For, we have the right to, to, to assemble, the freedom of speech and all that, right? That was taken away from us. And we were forced to worship in our homes. We couldn't, we couldn't assemble like this. I wonder how many of us here this morning would actually follow the Lord Jesus anymore. How many of us would still follow him? How many of us would say, I am a follower of Christ, and no matter what happens, I'm going to keep following him? I wonder how many of us would still try to join together in worship, meaning in our homes. How many of us would still try to be faithful to evangelize? How many of us would still be faithful to live the life of the Lord? I wonder. If even I would be faithful. And so listen, the plan of God is for all of us to live an obedient life that pleases the Lord, and that involves suffering and service. John's service was that he taught the word of God, and he was preaching about Jesus. All of us need to have some kind of service. It's the plan of God for all of our lives. What's your service? And so may we all come to understand this and not be surprised when it happens to us, but let us all rejoice. Let us rejoice that we're counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so the plan of God for all of us involves suffering and service. Secondly, and I'm just going to go through a, a few of these verses, the person of Christ should awe and inspire us. It should awe and inspire us. John says here in verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. He seems to say that a lot, doesn't he? What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia. 
Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet. I'm going to save the rest of those that image for the next time we gather together. But John is given a unique prophetic vision of the exalted and glorified Christ. So everything we read from here on is a vision that is given to him that is unique. It's not given to anybody or everybody. You understand that? Just nod your heads and get done faster. Okay. So John says here that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. So first of all, what does he mean by in the Spirit? This is a term that could be said of every believer. Every believer ought to be in the Spirit as opposed to in the flesh. You should be living, I should be living my life as I am in the Spirit. I am not in the flesh. But it also could be said of, of having a purpose that you're going to do something, that you're determined to do something. In other words, Paul would say this in Acts chapter 19, he was, uh, actually Acts 20, he's warned not to go to Jerusalem because if he goes there, he, he's going to die. And he says, I'm gonna, I go bound in the Spirit. So no matter whatever happens, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm bound in the Spirit. In other words, Paul is saying, I'm determined to do God's will. He's in the Spirit. And as I said a minute, minute ago, it is used, this phrase, of the life that we as believers ought to be living. We are in the Spirit. It means to be filled with the Spirit. It means to be controlled by the Holy Spirit as opposed to living under the control of self or sinful desires, fleshly desires. So what does he mean here in the Spirit? Well, it's used four times here in Revelation. And each time, it means the same thing. And it's a unique thing. To be in the Spirit means that that John is being carried away by the Holy Spirit in some sort of vision or a dream. And that is what's happening here. John is being given a vision of Jesus, one that will be given to him to instruct, to write down what he sees to be given to the seven churches. So what John is being given here is a unique thing. And he's being told to write down what he sees. The time has come. The time has come for the church to know. For the church to know what is waiting for them to be encouraged to press on. In other words, God is not going to keep the church in dark anymore, so to speak. But he, the, the Lord is going to reveal to the church what is going to happen in the future. And so John is being carried away in the spirit. And he's going to unfold and reveal to John what is going to happen so that the churches would know. Does that speak to you? God wants the church to know. Now, God has a plan and a purpose for the people of God, for Israel. He's not forsaking them. But in this age of time, this time that you and I are living in, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is the focus of God. You are important. I am important. God is focusing all his attention on the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wants to reveal to us what is going to happen in the future. Now, why would he want to do that? So that you and I would know how to live our lives. So you and I would know what to expect. He's not leaving you and I in the dark. He wants us to know. And so John is carried away in the Spirit, and he's given us these words for us to know, and we are important to God. But it says that this happened on the Lord's day. It happened on the Lord's day. This is not saying that it happened on the Sabbath or Saturday, the seventh day of the week, but that it happened on the Lord's day. Um, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ met on Sunday. They met on Sunday because Jesus had risen on the third day, and then the, ch the early church began to, began to meet and worship the Lord Jesus on the day that Jesus rose again from the, day, from the dead. And so that day became known, listen, as the Lord's Day. And so you and I right now are gathered 
on the Lord's day. This is the Lord's day. It's separate from any other day during the week. During the week, you and I do what we got to do to provide for our family. We work hard. But today, Sunday, is the Lord's day. It's unique. It's set apart from other days. Now, I'm not trying to say this in a legalistic way to get us to be rigid and legalistic. Become like a Pharisee and, and come up, create laws to bypass other laws so that we can live a, live a life that we want to live. You know, I'm not trying to say that. What I am saying is this. This is the Lord's day. This is a special day that God wants you and I to show our love to Him, to gather as children of God, brothers and sisters to the Lord Jesus Christ to worship Him on this day. It is a day that belongs to the Lord. It is His day. Amen? It is the Lord's day. So John hears and he sees something that radically changes his life. What he sees encourages him. It encourages heart, his heart, but it also knocks him off his feet and nearly kills him, this vision. Look down at verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. This is an unbelievable vision that John is given. And what does he see? He sees that the voice is one like the Son of Man or the Ancient of Days. And we're going to look at that as from Daniel chapter 7 when we come back to this. Who is in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now, if you go over to verse 20, we're going to find out who or what are these seven golden lampstands. Verse 20, Jesus tells us, The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands he says, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. We'll get into that later. But look what he says here. And the seven lampstands, which you saw, are the seven churches. Isn't that interesting? Jesus is saying that the seven lampstands, the lampstands are the seven churches. In other words, this is encouraging. Jesus is not abandoning He's not forsaking the followers of Christ. He died, he was buried, he rose again. He is in their midst. He's not far removed. He is in their midst. He knows their plight. He's in the midst of his people. But isn't it interesting that Jesus calls the church a lampstand? That's what he's given the image. And so why is that? We well, have written back there, you see it there on the wall, you are the light of the world. That's what a lampstand is for. A lampstand is used to hold light and for light to, to be reflected and give light to the area wherever that lampstand is at. And that is what God is saying. The lampstand, you and I are the church. And so where is Jesus? He's protecting the church. He's in the midst of the seven, seven golden lampstands. He's, he's protecting the church, but he's also doing something else. And we're going to get to this when we get to chapter 2. He is evaluating. He's looking up, looking down. He's checking out the church. He's seeing what kind of church they are. Are they a faithful church? Are they living out the commandments that I've given to them? And so he's evaluating. In other words, Jesus wants to know this. What kind of light is the church reflecting out to the community where they're at? What kind of lampstand is Calvary Baptist? Look over at chapter 2, verse 5. Jesus' words of rebuke to the church in Ephesus. He says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. This church was being rebuked because they had fallen from where they were at. He says, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. What's a lampstand for? Light. And so, this is Jesus correcting and, and disciplining the church because they're not being a faithful lampstand. They're not portraying the light of the Lord Jesus Christ to the community where they're at. And so I want to bring this message to a close, 
and focus on that for a moment. Tom Rainer, in his book, Autopsy of a Deceased Church, just let that hit you for a moment, Autopsy of a Deceased Church. He says, one of the 12 ways to keep your church alive is for the church to maintain their imprint or their impact in the community that they're in. Or the church will become sick, they'll start dying, and eventually that church will die because they, they're no longer impacting their community. And so that you and I need to evaluate where we're at as a church. Are we impacting our community? What kind of light are we portraying where God has placed us? How can we keep our church from becoming a sick church, a dying church, or even a dead church? Because there are many churches that started off good, and they're now dead. They're dead because doctrinally they have forsaken the gospel, but also they're focusing on things that God doesn't want them to be focusing on. And we don't want to become that church. So how can we keep that from happening? How can we be the light that the Lord wants us to be? Well, it all begins with individual members. It all begins with individual members each individual member, according to Ephesians 4, needs to use their gifts and their talents, what God has in fact given you to do. You are here for a reason. You are to do your part, the gospel says. Do your part. Find out what your, your gift is and use it for the glory of God. We all need to be doing that. How can I serve at Calvary? How can I love somebody? How can I serve somebody? That should be what we're saying. We all need to be more evangelistic. It doesn't mean that you and I are preaching the gospel everywhere we go with our mouth, but it does mean that we all should be preaching the gospel with our lives. Everyone should know. After they get to know us, they should know where we stand. They should know that we are a follower of Christ, not because we're pointing out sin in their life, but because we love them. And we're there to serve them. And we're a blessing to them. Yeah, we live a certain godly life. And yeah, we don't do the same things that they do. But they should know that they can come to us because we have the words of life. We have the truth. And it also means that we should be trying to make disciples. All of us should be trying to make disciples, pouring our life into another believer's life, praying with one another, serving one another. And so I would ask you, as I bring this message to a close, that you would pray. You would pray for one another. You would pray for your leaders. We would cast a vision before you, live it before you, so that we can reach our Jerusalem. Dedham. So this morning we get a glimpse into the exalted and glorified Christ in the midst, in the midst of the church, protecting her, but also evaluating her. Part of God's plan for your life and my life is that we're going to suffer. Part of his plan is also that we would all be serving. Amen? And so as I close in a word of prayer, what does it look like for each individual person here this morning to, as we have here, to know Christ, to grow in Christ, and to show Christ. What step does God want you to take in your life? And as we close in a word of prayer, and we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, may you ask the Lord to reveal to you how you can be a part of the family of God and how you can serve and make an impact in the community that we live in. Amen. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes in prayer. And I'll just be silent for a moment and let you pray in your own words to the Lord this morning. Not only praying about what you heard, but also asking the Lord to prepare your heart.
for the Lord's Supper. Dear Lord, I, I thank you for this message you've given to us this morning, rem reminding us of our call and our place here. Just getting a little taste this morning of this vision of the glorified Christ as we meditate upon it more in the coming weeks, Lord, may it prepare us May it motivate us and encourage us to realize that the end is near. Time is now. We all need to step up. We all need to pursue you in a greater way, to know you more deeply, to grow in our understanding of you, to grow by serving you, discipling other people, maybe even being discipled ourselves. Oh, God, may you change each and every one of us. The culture of the church would become a growing, thriving culture, a loving community, a serving community. You would be pleased to find us all faithful living a godly life. May you have your way in all of our hearts and prepare us, Lord, as we partake of the Lord's Supper today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I would ask you to stand together, and we're going to read together. It's going to come on the overhead. Um, we have a covenant that... Um, is for anyone who desires to join Calvary Baptist Church would uh, uh, agree to the covenant that is uh, part of being a member here at Calvary. And uh, is it behind me? I didn't put it in the bulletin. There it is. Um, the, um, it, it, even though whether you're here this morning and you're not a member, it's okay for you to still read it. Uh, it gives you... Uh, um, an understanding of what we as Calvary want to live. Uh, we're not perfect at living this, right? Um, but we want to be. And so it's a good reminder, um, the first Sunday of every month, sometimes I forget to, to do it, just to remind us what kind of church we should be. And so we can read it together. And uh, let's do that now. Our covenant. For we will walk together in brotherly love. We will show loving care for one another and encourage, counsel, admonish one another. We will assemble faithfully for the worship and fellowship and will pray earnestly for others as well as for ourselves. We will endeavor to bring up those under our care in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We will seek by Christian example and personal effort to win others to Christ and to encourage their growth toward Christian maturity. We will share one another's joys and endeavor to bear one another's burdens and sorrows. We will oppose all conduct which compromises our Christian faith and will uphold high standards of Christian morality. We will prove the reality of our conversion by living godly and fruitful lives. We will maintain a faithful ministry of worship and witness education, fellowship, and service. We will be faithful stewards of our resources and abilities in sharing the gospel with the people of all nations. As a result of this covenant relationship, we will seek earnestly to live to the glory of God who brought us out of darkness into his everlasting light. We moreover engage that when we remove from this place, we will, as soon as possible, unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant, and the principles of God's word. 
Let's pray together. Father, I, I pray that uh, you would help us, reminding us about this covenant, but also helping us to live it out uh, each and every day and praying for each other when we see another brother or sister struggling to live out uh, this covenant, that we would come alongside them and encourage them to press on, that we would serve each other, love each other, we would be there for each other. Help us to do that, not just on Sunday, Lord, but even during the week as we have uh, weekly gatherings that we need to be more faithful at. God, I pray that you would work in us so that we would be ready. You would find us faithful as Jesus promises, I will come quickly. May we be found faithful. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated, and I'll have uh, the leaders come forward as we are going to um, partake of the Lord's Supper. Let me read verse, verses um, 23 to, through uh, 29 of 1 Corinthians 11, just to uh, remind us what we're doing right now. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. <coughs> Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man or a woman examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And so in a moment I'll pray and we'll partake together uh, the Lord's Supper here. But just as a way of reminder, uh, this is the Lord's Supper. This is not uh, you know, the, 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 the bread that you get and the cup that you're about to drink from. It's not just something that you do flippantly, not thinking about. Um, we are to discern what we're doing. Uh, this, uh, the bread represents the body of Christ. The cup represents the blood of Christ that was shed for us. Partaking of that cannot bring you, uh, you wash away your sins in any way. Uh, they are uh, only for the child of God, who's already saved, already knows that they are a child of God, already knows that they're forgiven, and they are in an act of obedience and faith, trusting these words. And they are um, drawing closer to the Lord by partaking of the Lord's Supper. Because it's, it's telling you, examine yourself. Where are you at spiritually? Are you walking with the Lord? Uh, do you confess your sins? Are you discerning what Jesus has done for you? Preach the gospel to yourself. Jesus died for you. He loves you. He was buried he rose again on the third day. Remind yourself what Jesus has done for you. If there's sin that you're, you're holding on to, turn from that sin. Ask God to forgive you. Partake in a new, refreshed way, reminding yourself that, you know, He loves you, but He doesn't want you to live in your sin. He wants you to turn away from that sin. And, uh, commit your life to the Lord. So if you're, if you're struggling this morning, when we uh, spend time in prayer before we partake, just ask the Lord to forgive you, right? If you confess your sins, the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Preach the gospel to yourself. You're forgiven. Christ died for you. Celebrate your forgiveness. Come to the Lord's Supper discerning what he has done for you. Feel the same way as he feels about sin. Remind yourself that he loved you and died for you. It's a wonderful time of celebration. But it also is a time of evaluating yourself. 
where you're at spiritually. And so, would you bow your heads? And uh, again, one more time, just ask the Lord to reveal to you, to search your heart. If there's anything in your life right now that needs to be turned from, confessed to the Lord, do that now. Lord, I pray that you would, your spirit would uh, search all of our hearts. That uh, there would be no sin that we know of, and even sins that we don't know of. That you would reveal those to us. You know us, Lord. We are weak. We're not perfect. We mess up all the time. You love us. And you're working in us. <laughs> you're bringing it us. You're bringing it us to completion. And I thank you that even now, this moment that we're having is a is a part of that plan to bring us to completion. As we examine ourselves and we ask you to help us, so I do pray for holy moments in all of our lives that we would all be taking steps of obedience. Thank you for your forgiveness. Now, as we partake, Lord, may we do it, do so discerning your body, preaching the gospel to ourselves, thanking you for what you've done for us, and celebrate our forgiveness. This I pray in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people say, amen. amen. So the brother, brothers here will um, serve you the Lord's Supper. And as you receive the, uh, the, the bread and the cup, just wait and we'll partake together. Change things up a little bit. You're usually on that side of the, the aisle. Would you mind praying and asking the Lord's blessing upon us?
on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take heed, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice for our sins. Please accept our worship. Help us to truly enter into this time discerning and knowing that we are thanking you for your body that was broken for our sins. We can't do anything to remove our sins. Only you can by your sacrifice. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' precious name. Father, we thank you for the offering, Lord, you offered your only son. Through this offering, we could draw near to you. Father, the gap between man and you, it was bridged. It was bridged by the cross, by your son's blood being shed for remission of our sins. This is an incredible thing, Lord. We thank you, we praise you, Lord, as we go through this week. And it's so deeply. Please help us to call this to mind often during the day, how precious it is that you give to us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
set aside this time to preach the gospel to our brother. Thank you for your death, burial, and resurrection. And even today, you impact our lives. And may we be so impacted that we go forth this day with no regrets, no conditions. stand for the singing of the song beneath the cross. Oh. 